Join me in your Bibles, uh, Matthew chapter 16, please. Matthew chapter 16. My uh, privilege to have been here before and now to uh, officially, there's kind of a, a funny thing about an installation. I was just a part of one last week, and uh, Tim's already been here and serving and working hard, but there's an official point of laying on of hands and prayer, and I get to preach this passage, and then Paul gets to give the charges, and uh, we take this very seriously. But uh, as I was coming in this morning, I love this side of the church, I love every side of it, but I spotted something, I don't know if you've seen it. (laughs) I mean, Tim, that's a little much, it's a little much. I put mine in the restroom by the gym. (laughs) No, that's not true for those. Matthew chapter 16, I begin reading at verse 13. And if you have the wrong chapter, just turn back a few pages to Matthew chapter 16. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, this is a huge question, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here's the foundation conversation. Here's the introduction. There had been hints of something, an assembly in the Old Testament, but here Jesus introduces what he's going to do. And the first thing he asks is, who do they say the Son of Man is? That's what he calls himself more than any other phrase. It's amazing. Son of Man. Meaning, baby of Mary. Ordained by God, who by the word of his power says, let there be a baby, and Mary is pregnant, but he calls himself the son of a human being. It's a beautiful story, but it's not just Christmas sentiment, it's the foundation of the church. This church is about a person who was here and who was the nicest person that ever lived in terms of love and strength and care for people, and holiness, and glory to his Father. Do you believe it? He was, if you go through, he's born. He becomes a boy. He, he astounds the doctors of philosophy and theology with his questions and his answers. He stands as a, as a man to teach, but he's also, for maybe 30 years, or at least until he's 30, a carpenter. Hello, he did the kind of work you do. I remember one time, true story. I'll always tell you if it's not true. (laughs) Right over here in the aisle, could be here today, I asked a man in the church to do something. It was in between services. And he said, oh, I can't do that. I'm just a carpenter. I said, do you know any carpenters in the Bible? And he did remember this one. Jesus sanctifies the saw and the broom and the house key and all of life. He's a man, a true man, and for that reason, he's able to die. So he's talking about his church, and he says in the introductory thought to the church, uh, who do they say the Son of Man is? Son of Mary Adopted son, I guess, in the sense of Joseph, but one of us. He's been tempted in every way you have. He understands our griefs and our pain. Yo! The answer is clear. Verse 16. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ doesn't mean his last name. He's the anointed one. From way back in early Genesis, it said, there's going to be a seed of a woman that will crush this snake. 
And then through the Old Testament, you have put your hand on the head of the lamb, son. All these sacrificial lambs, all, them, all of these speaking of something to come, someone to come. In the Psalms, he's called a number of times the anointed one. In Isaiah, it says, unto us a child is born through the womb. A son is given from eternity past. Micah, at the end of the Old Testament, says, and he'll be born in Bethlehem. Any questions? He's the anointed one. He's the one God has chosen and ordained to be the living Savior of the world and the conquering king of all evil. He's the one who will do away with all pain someday, not yet. He's the Lord of this church. So Tim will keep preaching Christ as a, Jesus as a human being, but also as the Savior, anointed by God, chosen to be the Christ, the King. Do you believe that? Do you rest in that? Or is that, oh, yeah, that's nice. I go with that. Now I got to get, no. He's your Messiah and Savior if you trust him. You go on and see uh, at the end of Luke, he's walking with a man and a woman or two men, I'm not sure. And it says, and this is after his resurrection, and they didn't know it was Jesus. And he began to explain to them, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures about him. He went through, I think he went through Genesis. He's the seed of the woman. Exodus, he's the lamb slain. And through the Old Testament, he just showed it led up to Jesus. And if all you know is the Old Testament, you're Jewish, you're God's chosen, look at all those verses that hint of someone to come. And if you combine it with the New Testament, look at all the verses that say, this is the one. He's the Lord of this church, the Messiah. Charles Spurgeon's famous for saying, take any text and run to the cross. Run to Jesus Christ. But he's also the head of, of, of the army of God or the family of God. Church is both. And you'll see, in, this is Jesus predicting or giving some big, strong clues about what the church is. And the first one, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I can hear Peter going, huh? The sovereignty of God does not negate the free will of man, but it's huge. The sovereignty of God is so far above us as the James Webb Telescope, with its pictures of trillions of miles of space, is above the things we take on our iPhones, especially the selfies. Look what he says, verse 17. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, Petra, rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Peter, you didn't make this up. You didn't get it on a whim. The whole issue of sovereignty of God goes beyond our poor power to add or describe. We just worship. But equally with sovereignty, not equally, but still a part of it is we get to choose. Peter chose to say, you are the Christ. And he would become the rock of the church. He would bring people in at Pentecost. He would be the foundation of the church. He had the keys to the kingdom, you're going to see, because he represents Christ. Do you believe in the sovereignty of God? I often get asked, even now when I'm at a church, do you believe in predestination? I, I'm always kind about it, and I say, yeah, here it is, Ephesians 1, other verses, he predestined us. But you still have to decide to believe and obey. 
One good way to describe it is it's a big ship. All the earth is a big ship. History is a big ship. But God will bring it into port at just the time he says. That's sovereignty. In the rooms, people are doing all kinds of things, some of them not good. And when he brings it into the port at just the right time, God will check every room. Jesus Christ will judge every person. Honor him. He's sovereign. And if you came to Christ, if you believe in Christ or do today, thank God. He stirs our hearts. He, he does the invisible. Can't understand it, we can worship. Is that you? He's sovereign Lord. That's a part of the church. Honor the sovereignty of God. One time upstairs, we were discussing a problem. It was one we couldn't solve and something that had happened in the church. And I remember one guy on staff said, I move we accept what has happened. And sometimes you have to. Get over the past bitterness. Get over something. You, you accept what is... God is still sovereign. That doesn't mean he likes everything. But Peter needed to know it's God's grace that I'm here. And you too. And me first. Next on your outline, number four. I'll be done when I get to the bottom of the outline, by the way, if you're <laughs> antsy to go. Number four, and he says this, that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. Well, look at it. But my Father is in heaven has revealed this. And I tell you, 16, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, Peter's confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. Now, there's a lot of debate about the gates of hell and the power struggle between hell and life, it probably means the gates of death. But he's saying, for sure, even though we die, the church goes on. Even though you die, you go immediately to be with Christ. He's saying, I'm going to build my church and death will not stop it. You'll keep going. You'll keep going now. And for the righteous cause of Christ the gates of hell but it does also indicate a struggle between Hades and the dark side and the light side so churches have problems often human cause I leaned into a church board not too many days ago and I said what are you trying to do to each other and to this church I can say anything at my age. <laughs> I leave town, too. <laughs> but the gates of hell means there's going to be huge problems. One time I said to some people who were leading a church, whose place is this? Whose church is this? Tim's know, Tim knows it is the Lord's. He will build my church Jesus Christ says this himself, I will build this church and the death itself or the enemy will not destroy it. Keep going until he comes. He doesn't stop. He says this funny thing. If you're Catholic or Protestant, you probably enjoy debating this. He says in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And all the disciples went, huh? Huh? Peter had the keys of the kingdom. If you're Catholic, you've studied this. If you're Protestant, you know, what does this mean? Well, it means he's the rock. His confession is the, the solid rock on which the church stands. But it also means Peter stands up with the keys on the day of Pentecost and says, anyone, anyone 
who admits their sin, repents of it, and comes to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he's just described. He opens the door to the floodgates to come in to the kingdom of Christ. Have you done that? It's a, it's a clear personal choice. Sometimes the battle of the church keeps going because some of the people aren't even sure of Christ as their Lord and their Savior. I want to say, God set this up. Peter uh, hears Jesus describe it, but later Paul's actually going to read some of the verses that talk about how the church is organized with multiple elders. And you've done that with an amazing picture of leadership by servanthood. And the pastor, yes, leading, but all of them together leading the church, and they have the keys of the kingdom, which means what they say you have to honor unless it's selfish or against the Bible. The church and the pastor tell the good news. They also talk about the bad news. So, so they have keys to the kingdom. They have this authority from God. And it's carefully handled. So at Pentecost, you know, thousands came in and trusted Christ as Savior. Are you in on this? Or are you just, it's easy to just wave at the church. Look what he does next, 21. From that time, right after that conversation, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, rise again. If you're Jewish, you may know that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon of that Friday, the special Passover Friday, the high priest is still going about ritual and in the temple and about to bring the sword down on the lamb that's slain for all of Israel. And all of a sudden, there's a shriek from another priest because the curtain rips from top to bottom at 3 o'clock, the moment Jesus died outside the camp. Ollie, Ollie, in free. Jesus dies for our sins. It's your centerpiece. There it hangs. There it says, everyone, be sure. When he died on the cross, every one of Note Larson's sins and yours were put on his back, on his soul, if you please. He cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? The sins of Adam and Eve and David and Bathsheba and Isaiah and all the prophets and all the people and all of ours and yours on Tuesday were paid for. He cries out, it is finished, which means it is paid for. Do you believe that? When you put your faith in Christ and who he is and what he did on the cross, that counts for you. God sees not your sins, not next week's sins. He sees them as totally judged. Blood covers law. Jesus' perfect blood covers our sins. Not only that, when you put your faith in Christ, his righteousness is credited to you. Whoa! God sees you not, not like, well, he kept a lot of the commands, but not some. No, he sees you covered by the righteousness of his perfect son. All kinds of verses say he covers us with his righteous. We stand in the beloved. That's in Jesus Christ. Oh, is that sure in your minds? You can go to church and Salute that and even sing about it, but not go to bed knowing it's positive. So part of the charge today will be run to the cross. Feature Christ and honor him as the risen Savior. And to each of us, be sure it's true in your personal life. Our confidence is as sure as the resurrection. I'm not done. 
In verse uh, down a little further, I'll pull it out, but it's in the context. He says, verse 26, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? He's getting people to think. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And then he says, some of you uh, standing here might see the glory of the Lord. Our eternity, the Son of Man will come. You read uh, uh, Revelation 19, 20, 21. Uh, a person, a king, uh, son of God, the Lord on a white horse with all the hosts of angels. He's called the Lord of glory, the Lord of angel armies, the Lord of hosts. In the Psalm 24, it says, lift up the gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up. He's coming. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, and he will return. My grandmother always used to say, perhaps today. But in the meantime, be the church he means you to be. And then we will live him with him on the new earth and the new heavens forever and ever and ever with total joy. No wonder Paul, in his longest sentence ever in Ephesians chapter 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He chose us in him to be blameless, to follow Christ. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. To the praise, let this church, allow this church to be to the praise of his glorious grace and to follow his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, who's the guarantee, the assurance of our inheritance. To the praise, that's why we sing, that's why we say, let us glorify him as Lord. And a few verses later, make it even more personal, he says, for the sake of his body, that is the church of which I became a minister, to make the word of God fully known. And that's what we have in Christ, the riches of the glory of his grace, the mystery. And the mystery revealed by the church is Christ would live within you, the hope of glory. We all have funny stories about the church, but the church is the body of Christ. Tim, preach this cross. Keep doing that. Honor Christ every time. Glorify him with every sermon. Hang the necklace of the cross around your conscience. And be the church God means you to be. In the name of Christ, amen. Now, Lord, thank you for this reminder of the beginning. Help us keep going. Help Tim and this group of leaders keep going for your pleasure and glory. As you pray, pray for this church, not out loud. If it's true you are in Christ, you trust him this way, thank him. If it's not true, ask him for help to turn and believe. In Christ our Lord, amen. This has been a message from the chapel in Akron, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today. Our Sunday morning services are at 9 and 1040 a.m. You can join us online for our services by going to akronlive.thechapel.life. For more information about the chapel, please visit our website at thechapel.life.